thanks so much for coming. Uh, okay, my name is George Caligeris, and I, I want to talk about Seferis. And I want to talk about him uh, in his effect on me as a writer, as someone who writes poetry, uh, someone who translates and teaches. So I'm going to start with a poem. Uh, it's called Ambassador of the Dead. And I uh, need to give you a little bit of background about this. My parents had a little grocery store. And um, they didn't know much about poetry at all. But they had lots of opinions about poetry. And they always voiced their opinions. And um, to know how little they knew about poetry, the first line will tell you. But they caught something about Seferis's voice. And however high the register, and I think Seferis's register can go very high, he talks about myth, he's extremely erudite, he knows the classical world uh, extremely well. Uh, he seemed to speak to these people, to these immigrants, refugees. And his, his poetry, inside his poetry, there's often references to crowded refugee transport ships, which he rode on as an ambassador. So I'm going to start with this poem. And there's a word in it. It's called trapezica. And it's, it, the word doesn't exist in Greek. And it was pointed out to me by Dia Philippides uh, from Boston College that the word didn't exist. And she said the closest word was trapezitica. And she said it occurred four times. She could only find four um, appearances of that word, and they were all in folk songs. But I couldn't change the poem because that's the way I remembered it from my childhood. So it had to stay in the, my ear. I don't think there's anything else you need to know. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll say some things about it at the end. My parents were never crazy about Kavafi. They didn't know much about poetry at all and barely had time to read anything but the papers. Though sometimes a poem they liked would appear in their beloved Hellenic voice, a poem that was always in rhyming stanzas and deeply nostalgic. Or else I'd show them one of the modern Greek poets that I was trying to translate and ask for their advice about a line. Is this for school, they'd say? My parents were never crazy about Kavafi. To them, he was too refined, too Alexandrian. And they were only peasants, Choriatis. And there was no Ithaca for them to go back to. When I'd beg them to read the Greek, they'd balk when they got to his purest, Katharevus addiction. They just couldn't stomach its formalist starch. His poems were never demotic enough, never trapezica, songs to be sung across the kitchen table. And if I read them elitis, Odysseus elitis too, was too elitist to trust, too drunk on the island sun of his own Ionian vision, to people for whom elevation meant being raised in the steepening shadows of Peloponnesus. The great Odysseus, my father would chide, and if Yanis Ritsos spoke their working class language and his poems weren't hard to follow, still, once they heard that Ritsos was Marxist, that's all they needed to know. But read us some more Seferi, I hear them say, as I sit and write at a green formica table, the same one where we sat together and ate in another century. Was it Mandelstam? who said that poetry to him was bread from the kitchen table, but that his words were dead if he tried to start a poem by looking up at the stars. Osip Mandelstam, who wrote, the evening stars against the horizon glistened like salt on the blade of an ax. I think my parents would have liked that verse and called it trapezica, Saying that, their shades appear in the table's reflection. Looking up, 
as if they were thirsting for something to drink. Read us some more, Seferi. Noblesse oblige, Seferi Avis, that haughty diplomat who, in his British banker suits, had seen the world. French symbolist figs, and Earl Grey with Elliot, and stones too heavy to lift without his learning. But also deep silence as old Europe explodes, and crowded refugee ships as a form of transport. Ambassador of the high modernist, ancient dead. Read us that one about Stratis. You know, Stratis Thalassinos, I hear my parents intone. Their voices, as soft as the hiss of the surf and Seferis, calling from the floor of the Dead Sea, though the smooth formica shines green as the placid Aegean of poems. And then my mother returns to her ironing board, the steam iron dipping like a prow that's driving through choppy waves, the pile of freshly laundered butcher's aprons as white as whitewashed Piraeus. And now my father's back at his block, still reading the smoking entrails. He has turned the victim's head so that its eyes are facing Arabus or Smyrna. I'm spreading handfuls of sawdust and watching it soak up the blood. A uh, couple of things I want to say about this poem. Uh, You know, if you look on the next page for a second, um, there's some very famous lines from Seferis that end his great long sequence, Myth of Our History, Myth Historima. And um, the lines, should the blood happen to darken their memory and overflow, let them turn the heads of the victims toward Arabis. What those lines are referring to is a very famous moment in the Odyssey. It's a moment that was very important to Ezra Pound, too. It's the moment when Odysseus goes down into the underworld, and to get there, he has to pour the blood um, from a sacrificial animal so that the dead can drink the blood and speak. So in a way, because my father was a butcher, you know, I was able to draw to get the end of the Seferis in, so that's not only, poem is not only about Seferis, but I think it, it um, draws on an image that was central to him and goes back to Odysseus. And Odysseus is the great figure who appears over and over again in Seferis. Um, and I think, you know, in my own mind, when I think about the Odysseus voice, I, I, I the Odysseus figure, I think one of the reasons why it works so effectively in Seferis is that he didn't try to be Odysseus. He wrote as a weary ambassador who was going from country to country watching Europe explode, um, telling T.S. Eliot, I have no time to write, I work 15 hour days. And I think all of that contributed something to his voice that people who were familiar with the sort of horrors of the 20th century connected with, even if they couldn't understand the reference to um, Homer. Um, there was something in his voice that was more direct and more convincing to them uh, than the other modern Greek poets. Uh, I want to go on, I'll come back to some of my own poems, but I want to go on and talk about Seferis and read I want to read from this page that says, uh, from the Nobel Prize acceptance speech. You can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, Seferis gave a very short Nobel Prize acceptance speech, but it was brilliant, and I think it was beautifully crystallized. The things that were most important to him, and Just want to say one, I want to make one other point about that previous poem before I go into the things that are most important, because it all springs from what he called a double exile. He said he was exiled because of the catastrophe at Smyrna, when the Greeks tried to take back Constantinople. His family had moved to Athens, and he was exiled again by the Second World War. 
so he was a, a wanderer. Um, but here's his, his uh, acceptance speech, and I'll read it. I'll read the main um, passages and say some things about them. I belong to a small country, a rocky promontory in the Mediterranean, with no other assets than the struggle of its people. These lines become more poignant today, given the struggles of Greece. The sea and the light of the sun. Our country is small, but its tradition is vast. And what characterizes this tradition is that it has been conveyed to us through the centuries without interruption. The Greek language has never ceased to be spoken. My classics professor loved to recite this idea that no generation in 3,000 years, there had always been a classroom somewhere that was studying Homer. Uh, it has undergone the changes that any living thing, how interesting, any living thing must undergo, but there is no break in its course. Another characteristic of this tradition is its love for humanness, its rule of justice. I'm going to talk quite a bit about justice, DK in the ancient Greek. In ancient tragedy, which is organized with so much precision, whoever exceeds the measure must be punished by the Arenues, the Furies. The same law is valid even when physical phenomena are concerned. The sun, said Heraclitus, will not overstep his measures, and if he does, the Arenues, the goddesses of vengeance, the handmaids of justice will find him out. What moves me most is to observe how this sense of justice had so deeply permeated the Greek soul that it, for them it had also become, it had become also a rule of the world of nature. I just want to stop for a minute and, and if you look uh, further down, you can see that fragment of, uh, of an Aximander. And what Seferis is saying is that uh, even the sun, if the sun goes out of its orbit, it will be punished. Anything that oversteps its boundaries will be punished. Anaximander, in this fragment down below, I won't read it, says that the universe is basically organized as a harmony. When it gets too cold, it's, it re reasserts its balance by establishing the hot. Anytime it gets, goes in one direction, it will come back to a median point. This was so important to Seferis and, and fascinating to me too because for him, um, justice was in nature. It wasn't someplace outside. And very late in his, um, his journals, he talks with a great emotion about behind that sun, in the middle of World War II when Nazis were causing devastation, behind the light of the sun, the Furies are coming. The Furies are going to reassert the balance. The goddesses of vengeance will appear. Um, and I'm going to talk about that because I think um, he's uh, so concerned about this. And really, he called it, in, in a beautiful phrase, he called it the mechanism of catastrophe, that um, there was always some sort of persuasion, some patho, that caused a violent act, caused hubris, which caused Ate, a violent act, and this kept repeating itself. Um, here's the next paragraph. As one of my teachers wrote, one of my teachers, at the beginning of the last century, we shall be destroyed because we did wrong. This man was an illiterate. He learned to write only at the age of 35. But in modern Greece, the oral tradition is as deeply rooted as the written tradition. Um, some of you probably know he's referring to Makrianis there, the great 19th century general hero of the, of the war for freedom and a great historian. Um, Seferis has a terrific essay about Makrianis, but the sort of the simple and profound moral conscience of the people uh, is from, is in his poetry from the very beginning. It's probably he claims that it has to do with the village he grew up in, which was the village of Scala. Seferis was certainly came from an aristocratic background, but nonetheless, all around him were these uh, pretty much fishermen. Um, and he, he uh, trusted their sense of language, and he trusted the folk poetry. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the different 
the way that he worked in, I think, all the layers, every layer of the Greek language, from the ancient to the classical to the, um, to the biblical koine, to the Byzantine, to the demotic folk, to the contemporary demotic. I mean, Kavafi is a little different. Kavafi picks and chooses. Kavafi likes the Byzantine world and the Hellenistic. And Seferis gives you this sort of whole tapestry of all of the language. And he, uh, he places great emphasis on the, on the folk. Uh, here's the last sentence. Um, I've broken up his talk. These are just paragraphs. Here's the last sentence of his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. When on the road to Thebes, Oedipus met the Sphinx and was given an enigma to solve. You know, the enigma, whatever walks on four feet uh, in the morning, and three, then two. Uh, his answer was man. His answer was human being. This simple word destroyed the monster. We have many monsters to des destroy. Let us consider Oedipus' reply. And, and um, this too is part of the central concerns of Seferis, is the, hu hu the human being at the center of the universe. It, more than the gods, the human being. And I think that simple idea that to a monster you answer the human being, I mean, that's one idea that from the ancient Greek was not corrupted. And certainly, the Athenians corrupted their own ideas and became an empire. The Spartans had their own, uh, their own force of corruption that, that uh, changed their hegemony. But this idea, I think, can't be, I, I don't think you can make a crusade out of it. I don't think you can make a jihad out of it. it it's, it's central to that idea of the Greek humanity in nature. Uh, and uh, 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 read this. He has many quotes about Aeschylus. Um, he loved Aeschylus, and I think there could be more work. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't know, I haven't followed all the scholarship about Seferis, but it seems to me that he's the great poet of the tragedians. You know, if Seferis is, uh, Kavafi is the great poet of the Hellenistic world and the Byzantine world, it's, it's mainly Aeschylus, what he did with Aeschylus. Uh, feelings I find in Aeschylus that reassure me, the security and balance of justice, without sentimentality, without moralizing, without psychology, like a law of the universe, clean, uncorroded, and the authenticity of that voice, its authority, the greatest order, taxis, I know, uh, the just person being the measure of life. Uh, Okay, let's go on to these, this uh, fragment from The Secret Poems. I want to talk a little bit about translation. Uh, I think it's the next page. Um, the Secret Poems were very late in Seferis' life, and, and um, very difficult poems. They're fragments, most of them. And this. Uh, they came out in the 70s, but to remind you of history that you probably know better than I do, some people here, uh, in 1965 and 66, Seferis writes about rumors of a conspiracy to take over the country. In 1967, the colonels do take over the country. Um, there's nothing overtly political that I can see in the secret poems, but there's lots of suggestive uh, sort of coded language. Um, so here's, here's a fragment, and I'll, I'll, what I'll do is uh, I'll read the Greek first, and then on the bottom I'll read Keeley and Sherrod's, um, you know, very fine translations, translations that have held up for, for, for almost 40 years now, and then I'll read my own. Pios vurgomenos potamos mas pire, mena mas to vitho, trechi to rimo pano apto kefali mas, vigizi tanathra kalamia, uh, kalamia, tanathra kalamia. Uh, here's here's uh, Keely and Sherrod. What turbid river took us under? We stayed in the depths. The current flows above our heads bending inarticulate reeds. And here's my, um, my version. 
I can't remember which murky river it was that carried us away. We sank like stones. Now the rush of the current is over our heads, and the swaying reeds on the water are writing something none of us can fa could fathom. Um, the vudko menos word is so great, and you can see that in the Greek. Um, it's such a wonderful word. And I think Keely and Sherrod's turbid gets the turbulence of that word, the sense of brimming. Um, but it's also when he says, Pios, I mean, he, he can't remember. And suddenly, where it's a river, so it's like the river Lethe, the river of oblivion, the river that causes you to forget. So I think it was important to get that in. So I got in, I tried to say, to, 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 to sort of use that as an opportunity um, for my own translation. I can't remember which murky river it was. I also wanted that sound of remember and river because there's so much sound play in the Seferis. Um, for instance, um, Kefali and Ligizi, um, that, that way that the head re rhymes with the bending, the swaying of the reeds, and, um, you know, one can easily see the heads of the mob swaying like a reed. The reeds like a sort of penmanship exercise, an empty exercise. And I wanted to, to, to get the sort of swiftness of what was happening, the sort of political catastrophe that was happening, and the sort of obliviousness to the catastrophe that is in this little fragment. I can't remember which murky river it was, line break, that carried us away. I couldn't get the turbid, but that carried us away, I think, gets the overflow of the river. And carried us away, to me, is something Seferis talks about over and over again, which is people being carried away, carried away by political slogans. Um, it, the Greek simply says, uh, we stayed in the depths, and, and, and uh, that menamesto uh, vitho. I had, we sank like stones, because I didn't think, you know, part of this is, is choices that you make as a writer, and you're always going to fail. A translation's always a failure. It's an exercise in failure. And I think the thing to my, my way, I'm just talking about my way of translation, is that, I uh, can pass this back to her. Uh, I want it to sound like a poem. I want it to have the force of a poem in English. I want to stay as close as I can to what the Greek is saying. But I don't want that to restrict me, uh, you know, restrict me so far that it sounds like translation because then to me it's dead. And so some of my decisions are based upon that. Um, the Kilian Sherrod says the current flows above our heads. Uh, you know, over our heads is a, is a colloquial American idiomatic expression. Something was happening that it was just over our heads. We didn't comprehend it. And you can get, I think, more force more force out of the word current, which is both the water and it's the current situation, the current political situation. Um, you know, that line, which murky river it was that carried us away, I wanted the sort of the turn of the line to be the turn of an era, because that's what Seferis felt, an era, whole era had turned. Um, the, the real problem is tanathra kalamya, which is, you know, to me the words, the polysyllabic words together are sort of almost mirroring each other like reeds on the water. Uh, but there was no way I thought, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to go with the abstraction and say inarticulate. Because I think again in English it sounds like a translation. It sounds like you're not reading poetry, you're reading um, the literal meaning of the Greek, which um, may be very far from the, from the lyric meaning, the lyric thinking of the language. Um, 
so I, you know, I, I changed that to, to, to writing something as if the reeds were just aimlessly going back and forth. All these treaties that were being signed that, that turned out to be disastrous, writing something none of us could fathom. And fathom is both the dead under the water, fathom is the living dead, uh, not able to fathom the political situation. I was coming over here, I was thinking too about, uh, Sferis talks a little bit about Dante, but Dante in the Commedia, in different places he talks about the dead, different places in the Inferno, and he says um, the only thing they can't, they know the past and they seem to know something about the future, but the dead, the damned, those in the underworld, they know nothing about the present. And this, this, I, I think there's some of that here too, the rush of the current, what's happening now uh, is, is um, is incomprehensible. Uh, Seferis, I had written this down a long time ago, but he had recorded in his journal um, a taxicab driver had said to him during this time, don't you understand, sir, words have lost their meaning in this country writing something none of us could fathom. Words have lost their meaning. It's exactly what uh, Thucydides says in the history of the Peloponnesian War, that words were drained of meaning, were drained of value. Um, let me read the Greek one more time. And Pios uh, menos potamos maspire Menema sto vitho, trekito rima pano apote kefalimas, ligizi tanathro kalamia. Um, and then Kilian Sherrod, what turbid river took us under, we stayed in the depths, the current flows above our heads, bending inarticulate reeds. Okay, I want to go on to the next page. I, partly what I have on the next page is uh, I'm going to be doing something for Professor Rapti's class on Seferis at, 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 over at Harvard. And they're talking about Seferis as a modernist. And I want to talk a little bit about the modernism. So this page that has from Salamis in Cyprus, if you can look at that. These are passages from one poem. And I think all of you are probably familiar with Sefer that Seferis was a modernist. He was sort of grouped with Eliot and Pound. Um, but I think, I mean, from my own perspective. Severus' modernism was much different, even though he used Eliot a lot and was criticized for it at times. So it's too, much, too many echoes of Eliot. I don't think that's true. But the difference, I think Severus' brand of modernism, again, this is not, I'm not speaking here as an academic, I'm just speaking as a writer, is much more like the Italian poet Montale. Montale was a great 20th century um, Italian lyricist wrote my, my, many of his great poems were written during um, Mussolini's uh, dictatorships, but uh, over a long period of time too. And the difference I think with Montali and with Seferis has to do with the Italian language and the Greek language. That, for instance, when Pound's version of modernism and the modernists were trying to use fragments from literature and trying to, you know, um, <coughs> With these fragments, sure, uh, 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 sure up, as 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 Eliot says, shored against our ruins. They were trying to build these poems out of sort of monuments, uh, fragmentary monuments of the culture. Um, with Pound, when Pound uses a Gre ancient Greek word, he puts the ancient Greek word into the English text. So, I mean, it's brilliant, and Pound had a great ear for the Greek. Uh, even though I asked my classics professor, who was a Poundian, uh, Donald Con Ross, great Poundian, and he said uh, Pound didn't know much Greek, but his ear for Greek was wonderful. Problem with that is it's pastiche. Um, if you insert a Greek word into the English, you know, the stitching of the poem breaks apart. Seferis, well, well starting with Montali, Montali could go back through the Italian. Um, there's a lot of Dante in, in um, Montale. And as a matter of fact, so much it's like 
chlorine in water. You don't even notice it. But the Italian's going straight through the Renaissance back to Dante. And through Dante, he gets Virgil, because Virgil was Dante's guide, and he gets the Roman world. And that's something, that's, you know, that's going down through layers of your own language. And that's what Seferis could do, and that's what Seferis' modernism was much different. Eliot and Pound were going outside their own cultures. They were going to Europe. They both left America. There's no poetry there. It's in Europe, they said. And here's a, a quotation from David Ricks, a terrific modern Greek scholar, uh, the son of Christopher Ricks, the great British uh, critic. Homer's words, still present in the language, present in the Greek language, continue to exert their power. And it is possible for the Greek poet, in ways not imagined by Eliot, to write with a sense that the whole of the literature of Europe, the whole of the literature of Europe from Homer to the present, comprises a single simultaneous order. So you can, what Seferis can get is he can get both the fragmentary modernists and he can get a sense of a whole mural, not a pastiche. Uh, but here's, uh, here's um, I, I've taken some, some parts, I've broken up a poem, a very long, not very long, but a, a complicated poem by Seferis called Salamis in Cyprus. Uh, and it, it um, as Ferris was very concerned about what was happening at Cyprus, in Cyprus at the time, and, and the Greeks uh, having their, you know, getting their legitimate right to the island, although Ferris did not want to displace those Turkish people who had been there for, for a long, long time. But he wrote this poem, and it has all these different kinds of language in it. I want to sort of go through them with you just to see, and you can go back on your own and read the poem yourself, but just to see sort of how he's, as a modernist, was using fragments. Here's one part of the poem, one, this sort of multi-voiced poem. Earth has no handles for them to shoulder her and carry her off. Wheat doesn't take long to ripen. It doesn't take much time for the yeast of bitterness to rise. It doesn't take much time for evil to raise its head and the sick mind emptying doesn't take much time to fill with madness. Okay, the last three lines, you know, are so prevalent today with some of the madness of sick minds. Uh, but those, the, it begins with a quotation from Macrianis. Earth has no handles for them to shoulder her and carry her off. So that's 19th century Greek in a poem about 20th century Cyprus. And then the next part of the poem is a quote from a British commander who fought heroically um, on the Battle of Crete, defending the Greeks, uh, supporting the Greeks in the Second World War. Let us keep in mind the cause of this slaughter, greed, dishonesty, selfishness, the desiccation of love. Lord, help us to root these out. Those words to me sound like Aeschylus, but they're the British commander. And, and Seferis is putting those in to remind the British that they're on the wrong side now, because the British did not, uh, you know, very, you know, Ferris felt in very underhanded ways had changed um, the political cl climate. But here's the end of the poem. Um, there's two, uh, these, these two stanzas uh, are very close to the end. Um, now on this pebbled beach, he's on Cyprus, it is better to forget, talking doesn't do any good. Who can change the attitude of those in power? Who can make himself heard? Each dream separately without hearing anyone else's nightmare. Uh, this sort of pessimistic voice that must have been in Seferis's head and he must have heard all the time as an ambassador, as a minister of, of uh, what was called information. Um, he, he had a, a, a high position in the sort of Greek media. Uh, but then the voice is answered by lines from Aeschylus's The Persians. And The Persians is a play about um, the, about the uh, Persian War, which Aeschylus fought as a soldier in the Persian War. And this massive Persian army was defeated by the Greeks. And the Greeks 
in that moment turn from groups of squabbling city-states into a country. So here's the lines he quotes from Aeschylus. True, true, that's true, that pessimism is true. But the messenger moves swiftly, and however long his journey, he'll bring to those who tried to shackle the Hellespont the terrible news from Salamis. What Seferis is referring to there is that the, when the Persians invaded Greece, uh, Xerxes, in a supreme act of hubris for the Greeks, uh, he tried to build a, 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 a makeshift, uh, very elaborate uh, bridge across the Hellespont, and the sea had destroyed the bridge, and they had to rebuild it. And when the Persians rebuilt the, the bridge, Xerxes whipped the sea. He had the sea whipped. And for Seferis, the sea is, is the perfect example of measure. It, it's, it rises up, it goes low, it always reassert, reasserting the balance. And I think that, to me, that, that little stanza could be Kavafi, has the tightness of a Kavafi ethical historical poem, true but the messenger. The messenger's going to come to tell the Persians, you know, at the Battle of Salamis, your ships were closed in, your fleet was massacred. Uh, and then the final lines of the poem, voice of the Lord upon the waters, which is, is right out of the Psalms, the Septuagint Greek Psalms, and then there is an island, which is directly out of the play, uh, out of the Persians, the play by Aeschylus. So he brings together the Koine Greek and the ancient Greek. I think that, word, that phrase, there is an island, is also an echo of Eliot's very beautiful poem, Marina, about, uh, um, about islands. And, 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 and uh, it actually, it begins, Marina begins, what seas, what shore, what gray rocks, and what islands? There is an island. Okay, that, I hope, gives you some sense of the... Of the um, of the modernist. And what I want to do now is go on to something a little bit more elaborate. And that's this poem, The Argonauts. And I'd like to call up uh, Maria Zerbos, uh, who is a, a terrific young poet and translator and video artist, and, and, and a young writer whose, whose own voice is, comes right up out of Seferis in many ways. But she'll read the Greek, so you can hear it from a native speaker. Αργοναύτες και ψυχή η μέλη γνώσεστε αυτήν εις ψυχήν αυτή βλεπτέων. Το ξένο και τον εχθρό τον είδαμε στον καθρέφτη. Ήτανε καλά παιδιά οι συντρόφοι, δε φωνάζαν ούτε από τον κάματο, ούτε από τη δίψα, ούτε από την παγωνιά. Είχανε το φέρσιμο των δέντρων και των κυμάτων που δέχονται τον άνεμο και τη βροχή, δέχονται τη νύχτα και τον ήλιο, χωρίς να αλλάζουν μέσα στην αλλαγή. Ήτανε καλά παιδιά, μέρες ολόκληρες, ίδρωναν στο κουπί με χαμηλωμένα μάτια ανασένοντας με ρυθμό και το αίμα του κοκκίνιζε ένα δέρμα υποταγμένο. Κάποτε τραγούδησαν με χαμηλωμένα μάτια όταν περάσαμε το ρημόνισο με τις αραποσικές κατά τη Δύση, πέρα από τον κάβο των σκύλων που γαυγίζουν. «Η μέλη γνώσεστε αυτήν», έλεγαν, «εις ψυχήν βλεπτέων». Έλεγαν. Και τα κουπιά χτυπούσαν το χρυσάφι του πελάγου μέσα στο ηλιόγερμα. Περάσαμε κάβους πολλούς, πολλά νησιά, τη θάλασσα που φέρνει την άλλη θάλασσα, γλάρους και φώτες. Δυστυχισμένες γυναίκες, κάποτε με ολολιγμούς, κλαίγανε τα χαμένα τους παιδιά κι άλλες αγριεμένες γύρευαν το Μέγα Αλέξανδρο και δόξες βυθισμένες 
στα βάθη της Ασίας. Αράξαμε σακρογιαλιές γεμάτες αρώματα νυχτερινά, με κελαϊδίσματα πουλιών νερά που αφήνανε στα χέρια τη μνήμη μιας μεγάλης ευτυχίας. Μα δεν τελειώνουν τα ταξίδια. Οι ψυχές τους έγιναν ένα με τα κουπιά και τους καρμούς, με το σοβαρό πρόσωπο της πλώρης, με τα βλάκι του τιμονιού, με το νερό που έσπαζε τη μορφή τους. Οι σύντροφοι τέλειωσαν με τη σειρά, με χαμηλωμένα μάτια. Τα κουπιά τους δείχνουν το μέρος που κοιμούνται στα κρογιάλι. Κανείς δεν τους θυμάται. Δικαιοσύνη. One of the things I want to uh, mention when, when Maria was reading, and she, it, those five lines from the end, Metanoneropo espaze, the way she hit that in the middle of the line, Timorfitus. Um, there's a lot of things I could say about this, um, about this poem, and, and I'll, I'll try to tell you just a little bit about what, what I was trying to get at in my translation of it. Um, and I'll read it, I'll read it in a second. Um, uh, it's, it's very much, it, you know, uh, it reminds me in some ways of, of Eliot's Journey of the Magi, that there's some journey and it's in a, a dramatic monologue form. And it starts off as the uh, Jason and the Argonauts pursuing the Golden Fleece, and then it becomes Odysseus and his crew. And I think those lines about, um, about um, you know, going into the heart of Asia, you know, I, in my reading of that, you know, going after some treasure in the heart of Asia, I think that's the attempt to take back Constantinople. And there's a great ambiguity at the end of the poem is that, well, were these people heroic and they're not remembered because they don't have a poet who's worthy of them? Or was it, was it foolish and they're not remembered because it's, um, they, they didn't, it, 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 it's not a, a worthy of, a, a, you know, worthy a, a, of being immortalized in, in poetry. And there's lots of, two things I did, I'll read my translation in a minute, but two things <sighs> I did was, one thing I did was I took out the beginning because the beginning is a, those four lines about the stranger and if the soul is to know itself, it must look into a soul, the stranger and the enemy. I took that out because when I put it into my own book, I would put that into a note. Uh, and it's, it's partly, you know, I think there's a big idea there in Plato. It's a quote from Plato. And I don't want it to get in the way of, of the, the story about the rowers. But I would put it in a note and I would say, this is what the poem really says. But this is my my version of Seferis's poem. And also, I don't use the Chaosini at the end because I, I just don't think that justice does justice to that word which is an Aeschylean word and has all those complexities that I was talking about before. And that all Seferis has to do for his learned Greek audience is to hit that word and they know that it has me. So I wanted the justice to be in the line itself, in the way that I ended the line, to have it be there but unspoken. The other thing is when Maria read those lines so beautifully about how they're breathing in rhythm, um, you know, the rowers are like, uh, so much of this, this poem, I mean, the, the beauty of this poem to me is the, um, the rhythms of it, the rhythmical breathing of it. Um, very, there's a poem that Seferis, Er, rather early poem where he says, he talks about the indissoluble beauty of rhythm in poetry. And Savides, the great critic, said, uh, you know, hardly ever is there a Seferis line that doesn't have a sense of music, of meter, of rhythm. The only way I could do that was to get it into, put it into um, iambic pentameter. It's really close to iambic in most of the lines, uh, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute, in most of the Greek lines. There are a few shorter lines. Uh, but let me read my version of the, of the poem in English, and then I'll talk about some of the 
some of the decisions I made. Um, do you have that? It's the, right after the Greek. Argonauts. They were decent fellows, my companions. They never complained about the hard work, the freezing cold, or the par parching thirst. Lashed by the wind and rain, they were steady as oaks, as steady as the constant passage of night and day, like waves that never change in the stream of change. That crew was a good one. They drew back their oars without ever lifting their eyes, breathing in rhythm as the sun rose and fell. And, the blood red, and the blo their blood reddened their sweaty, compliant faces. Approaching that desert island that lay to the west by the cape of barking dogs, the island famous for its Arabian figs, all of them suddenly broke into song, without ever taking their eyes from the task at hand. If the soul is to know itself, it has to look into somebody else's soul. Or so they sang as the dipping blades of their oars struck gold from the heart of dusk as they struck the water. Sailing by so many capes and islands, one sea flowed into another, until it was hard to tell if those shrill voices were gulls and seals, or the wild laments of women weeping for their children. While other voyages were lost in search of Alexander the Great's illustrious tomb, obsessed with treasure buried in Asia's depths, we moored in coves and gulped by evening's musk. Here the birds sang in the dark, and the water we cupped in our hands would later well up inside us again, finding our happiness had poured through our fingers. As soon as our craft approached another new island, another was always just over the horizon. The souls of my shipmates seemed to be one with their oars, rising and falling in rows of rusty oarlocks, one and the same as the rudder's wake, the grave expression of the prow, and those even strokes where their image broke in the water's shattered mirror. One by one, my companions closed their eyes. As the rowing benches emptied, then each man's oar was planted upon the shoreline where he sleeps. And there is no one now who knows their names. Um, just a couple of things, and uh, we can afterwards we can talk about this if you have questions about the translations. Uh, I'll just say a few things about it. I mean, there's lots of things in this poem that I think are, you know, I didn't feel I could get. I don't think Keely and Sherrod got them either. either. I mean, a simple phrase like kalapedia, I mean, which I heard my parents say all the time, isn't exactly slang. This, I, I couldn't figure out a way to get it in there. I used it sort of because Seferis often, his English was so British, I used it decent fellows. But there's lots of things like that in the poem that um, uh, was hard to, to get in. Um, I think the main thing I want to talk about is, is that uh, if you look at that, well, a couple of things. If you look at that sixth stanza, um, uh, where the image broke in the water's shattered mirror, I really wanted the, the, the broke to be in the middle of the line, just the way it is in the Greek. And um, uh, well, it, 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 an easy example to, to get, it, an easy earlier example is if you look at the Greek on the first page and the dipusan where the, the oars dipusan, right in the middle of the line. And so what you have is you have, there his line is long, there his line is Homeric, it's a hexameter, and he has three beats on one side of the line, and right when the oars hit the water, there is what's called the caesura, the breathing space. You have to take a breath. And on the other side, um, there's, there's um, three three beats too. And I was trying to get, uh, you know, trying to get at some of this by, by, um, in my, uh, you know, in my translation, uh, t 
trying to get that broke in the middle of the line and in the third stanza struck gold from the heart of dusk as they struck the water. Sort of having something happen in the middle of the line. Uh, it could be, um, you know, that uh, using a phrase like that, the heart of dusk, it's not really in the Greek, but I think it is in a way because the Greek word for dusk is so beautiful, which is um, the sun is growing old. And there's, there's a sense that they're in the middle of the ocean and their oars are striking, um, striking at the dusk and there's a heartbreak in that. Um, Let's look at the last, I'll just um, say something about the very end, you know, the last two stanzas. Uh, you know, the planting of the oars is a, is a very famous moment from the Odyssey where Neopino dies and they plant an oar for him, and he's anonymous. Um, he was just an ordinary, an ordinary um, crewman, but he had gotten drunk, and he had fallen off a roof, and he died. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's interesting that Seferis calls up El Pino there, because it's, it's a moment of great heartbreak for Odysseus, and, and I think that sense of shattering is in that too. Uh, um, the shattering sense of the youth that died, um, the, the waste of it. Uh, I wanted to sort of, you know, through repetitions in that sixth stanza, one and the same as the rudder's wake, the grave expression of the prow and those even strokes, to sort of have the beats going around the end of the line and then reasserting themselves in that last line, one by one, my companions close their eyes. And there's Odysseus, the last one left of the voyage. Uh, what I did in the last three lines, without using Dicchiosini, is, uh, and there is no one now who knows their name. Um, it, planted upon the shoreline where he sleeps is very close to the Greek, and it's very beautiful. And to me, it echoes a poem of Kavafis, when Kavafis talking about a grave where he saw a beautiful young man's grave and it said, on the grave it says, in the month of Athir, Lefkios went to sleep. And it's so painful that all they can say is went to sleep. And some of that is in, in Seferis's line. But in the last line, I, I really wanted to get that sense of negation of no and now, no is in now, and no is in no's. Uh, and names, and there is no one now who knows their names. Um, and leave it um, as ambiguous as I, I think um, Seferis wants it to be. But also, um, you know, the, the way that Seferis so beautifully can use the classical world is there too, because in the classical world, the dead are going to an underworld. That's the opposite of the Mediterranean. There's no light, there's no speech, there's no water. Um, and they're going to a place of utter negation. And that's there. I don't know exactly, you know, those beautiful lines when Seferis keeps talking about how they, they lower their eyes. And I could hear it when, when Maria was reading it. I don't know exactly what the significance is. It makes me think that he may have also included in this voyage that, that the rowers are the ones who don't hear the sirens. They don't hear the sirens singing. Remember when Odysseus puts wax into their ears. So they're just rowing. They're like the meter. And Odysseus is the voice of the poem. And the voice hears the sirens. Uh, I want to go on just to a little bit more. And I have that line about a love of indissoluble rhythm. Uh, there from Seferis. Um, I want to go to uh, two poems of mine, and I'm coming close to the end now. Uh, one is this poem, Lost in Translation, and it's from a, a longer sequence called um, Alzheimer's. And Seferis uh, appears in it, 
Um, Um, Seferis uses the word tzitzidisma to describe a, um, the chirp of a blackbird. And in that poem, you can see it on the page, um, yet the blackbird sings when it comes to drink, and sometimes you hear the turtle doves call. Don't drown the poem in deep plane trees. Nurture it with what earth and rock you have. For things beyond this, to find them, dig in the same place. So I, I had this, in various ways, I had these lines in my mind about this poem, um, this Alzheimer's poem. And it begins with a word, um, at the time I was translating a, a, a folk song, and I, I, um, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't find it in the dictionary. And I asked my mother what the word was, and she knew it right away, because she came from a village uh, culture. Lost in translation. Tsitsivani, a shrill chirp, as the blackbird makes when it descends to drink from a pure mountain spring in light Seferis. A word that draws on demotic roots so deeply obscure, it wasn't there in any of my dictionaries. Nothing from Oxford's modern and Byzantine Greek, Oladell and Scott. Then I looked it up in your eyes, incredulous as you turned from the kitchen sink to enlighten my ignorance with a terse couplet, fresh from your girlhood, a song about what the cicada sings at the height of summer, the dripping faucets gleaming, like a source that goes back to those poets who loved to sing so much they forgot to eat. Now they feed on the dew, but you don't remember. Um, you might know the myth about the cicadas, that they, they originally were poets, and they were, they were turned into these tiny creatures who sing all the time. Um, and, and in the myth, they, they loved to, to recite their poems so much that they didn't eat. Um, they f would forget to eat. Okay, I want to finish with one piece. It's called Islands. And, and this, we can talk about this if you have questions, but this poem, um, it's, it's, it's a poem, but the beginning of it the lines are very close, not exactly, but very close to lines from Seferis. A great moment in Thrush, when he describes these, um, these young boys diving off of a ship and they're going down into black water. Um, and I remember when I was a student, and I was a student of Derek Walcott, who's a great Caribbean poet who later went on to win the Nobel Prize. And I had showed him this and he said, um, he says two things. He said to me, um, you know, I saw that in the Caribbean, the boys diving for coins. And he also said to me, um, Seferis was a great influence on me. And at the time he was writing Omeros, the book about Caribbean version of the Odyssey. And he said to me, I couldn't have written that book without Seferis. And he also recited some Seferis in translation. And I don't know if that's, you know, I've never seen that in print anywhere, but he said that to me. And I think it, it says something about Seferis's reach. But the first half of this poem is Seferis, and then the second half is me um, talking about Seferis's poem. And I think that, you know, I was thinking about this coming over here, that, you know, it's hard to say what is poetry and what is translation. Um, we, we look for opportunities in lines. There are issues and opportunities when we're writing lines. And that's true when we're translating and that's true when we're writing poems. We can't, th there's, th you know, we're never really original in the, in the sense that we, we block out everything that we've heard. Allusions, um, phrases are always coming to us from other poets. So this poem to me sort of brings together, I think, what I try to do, which is both to translate and, and to write poetry. And sometimes they come together um, in the same Peace. Uh, here's the poem, Islands. They're still going down in Seferis. Those boys who dove from the dipping bowsprits, pushing off with their feet as corkscrews of foam unfurl in the wake of their plunge. Their naked bodies about to blend with the blackness that gleams on their skin from below, which is where they go swimming down through a passage of language like water, alive to its every waver, so lucid each diver 
might rise with a solid gold coin between his teeth, as the currents they make still shake the skiffs above them, whose wind-torn sails are stitched by the sun's gold needles, whose wooden keels as they pitch are cocked with light. He wrote it down in the turbulent, jubilant wake of World War II, one morning when all the islands were iridescent and the lush Aegean, as green as it ever was, as green it wa as it was in the play by Aeschylus on that buoyant day when the bay was flowering with corpses, just as the herald says it was, returning from Troy, or was it Salamis? They're still going down in Seferis, down at oblique angles to the gloom, holding their breath as long as the breath of the poem impales Seferis to rhythmical depths he couldn't have known, unless those divers get to the bottom of it, converging on pebbles bright with exorbitant dark. Each body is smooth, smooth as an ivory flask of oil. Each line is taut as the rope that tugs at their waist. I mean, just want to say a couple of things about this and I'll finish. Um, one is that that idea of the blackness and the light that I talked about earlier, that both of them, you know, I don't want to press this too far, but, you know, some interpretations of this sort of all the wasted youth who died in that war in those sort of bodies going down into the black, but there's gold there too. I mean, the gold of justice is part of the poem. The line flowering with corpses is a line by Aeschylus, and it's a line that occurs in Agamemnon in a play by, about Troy. It sounds, it's a brilliant speech in in the Aeschylus play, and it sounds as though it's something that Aeschylus saw. And every, you know, all the classical commentators say, that's Salamis. He's using Troy to talk about the war at Salamis because Aeschylus fought in the Persian War. And those are the bodies. But what struck me that's so um, brilliant and, and as, if, as if Aeschylus had read Seferis, in a way, um, is that Aeschylus doesn't identify the corpses. He doesn't say those are the corpses of the enemy. And what so haunts me about that, to go way back to what I was talking about before, about the mechanism of catastrophe, about hubris, about justice being in nature. What happened after the uh, Persian War is there was um, about 70 years of tremendous Greek flourishing in Athens, primarily in Athens. Of course, the Athenians became a sort of mafia, de demanding money from all the other Greek city-states. And eventually the Spartans, slow as the Spartans always were, Thucydides says they, 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 they uh, defeat the Athenians. And the Athenians, and Seferis couldn't have known this, but his poem, like some weird Greek omen, uh, I mean, Aeschylus couldn't have known this, but his poem, like some weird Greek omen, actually predicts what will happen because there will be corpses in the bay at Syracuse when the Athenians are defeated by the Syracusans and the Peloponnesian War ends. So, you know, I'm sure Seferis was, was alert to that. Um, thank you very much and we can, we can have some, some questions. Anything you, you'd like to talk about? Is that you? No, I, I think, and I, I would defer to Maria on the Greek, but I I think, I, I mean, that's part of what I was saying about, you know, that, that getting the, the shattering in the middle of the line, that he keeps coming back to those oars breaking. <coughs> the, the, the voice is cool like a commander at the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. But by the end, it's personal. And um, one of the shipmates was Opinor. And the only time Odysseus weeps is for Opinor and for his mother. So all of that's there. Okay, thank you very much.